I feel like uh, singing again today. Do you know the song, I'm in his church? I learned this song when I was uh, in high school. I'm in his church, his glorious church. I did not join, oh, I was born. Though I was born, I have this word. Some glorious day, I'm going to sail away. It's by his grace, not by my works. I'm in his church. Good morning, church. Good morning. Isn't it really wonderful to be in God's church? Amen? All right. Wonderful to see everybody. And um, especially to Sister Sir Diane, right there at the back. Amen. Amen. God is good. Okay. So this morning we will continue our um, brokenness series. As we all know, um, in the announcement we heard and in the prayer we heard about those uh, loved ones that pass away, those that we love, cared for, done before us. Okay. So this morning we will be talking or we will continue that part of brokenness. And you know what, brothers and sisters, most of life's brokenness is brought about by grief. Okay. And grief comes into many different ways, and the pain that comes with it comes in different levels. Okay. And um, for example, as a parent, you know, we, we all wanted to, to give our children the best future. And um, due to some circumstances, for example, like financial uh, difficulties in life, you know, we, we fail to deliver that dream to our children. And as we see our family struggle in life, uh, in, in comparing it with other people who, who have it easy and who have it light, it hurts us and it breaks our hearts, right? And you know, when we see our children sick and not getting any, any better, and we just cannot afford them to bring them to, the, to a better healthcare facilities uh, because of financial limitations, it breaks our hearts. Or even if we cannot afford uh, you know, a, a better house for them, a better dress for them, it breaks our hearts to see our family like that, our children like that. And uh, somehow, those are some of the grief that we go through in life. <clears throat> and uh, oftentimes, when we have this grief in life, we go to the corner of our room at night and uh, we pray to God. We go to that corner right there and we kneel to God. We, we grieve, we talk to God, we appeal to Him, or maybe we question Him. Now, other instances for our grief can be our socio-economic situations. For example, if we uh, fail in our business ventures, if we lost a job, um, and uh, we, we fail in uh, a better or good uh, job opportunities, if we fail to make it in the scholarship grant, if our children fail in that grant in universities, <clears throat> if we fail <clears throat> in our relationships, this and others can bring us to grief. And I think the most heartbreaking of all, of all grief that can throw us, that can throw a man so deep into the abyss of the so-called grief is when we lost someone. Right? When we lost someone that we dearly love. And as we all know, that grief is a part of the cost. All of us have to endure because of living and loving. It's a cost that we have to take. It's a cost that you will experience 
while you are alive because you are alive and because you love. And those never born, they won't experience grief. They won't experience death, of course. That is why, you know, sometimes people wish they were never born because of the feeling of grief, the pain that comes with the grief, with grieving. So this morning, we will go ahead and go about with this title, Brokenness Over Grief. You know, grief is like a pandemic. It is like a pandemic, a global outbreak. Though it's not a disease, but somehow, if it hits you hard, it will hurt you, and at times, it will kill you. It affects everyone from, the, from across the globe, and it does not choose any gender. It does not choose any race. And it does not choose any age. And grief, it is no respecter of socioeconomic status. Whatever your status is, you will find or you will feel grief. And it crosses over language barriers. It crosses over religious beliefs. It crosses over cultural differences. You know, grief is not easy. Grief is not easy, and it is not fun to have. Oftentimes, people despise grief. We don't like it. And as much as possible, we don't want to feel it. And somehow, you know, just like the concept of the Passover in the Old Testament, somehow we are praying to God that this grief would pass over us. Somehow, we are praying to God that this grief will not come to us. But here's the reality, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, and those who are joining us in Zoom. The reality is, one way or another, all of us will and will be affected by grief in our lifetime, and it will hurt you. You will feel its pain. One way or another, grief will break us. Now, to see someone in pain and lose someone, even to lose our own life, are a part of this, what we call transitory life. Because we are just temporary in this life. We are just journeying in this life. So part of our transitory life is you will feel the pain. You will feel, you will feel grief in your heart. And soon, somehow, it will break us. Now, according to some uh, definitions, according to Webster, Mayo Clinic, and Psychology Today, according to Webster, grief is a deep and poignant distress caused by or as if by bereavement. According to Mayo Clinic, grief is a strong, sometimes overwhelming emotion for people, regardless of whether the sadness stems from the loss of a loved one or from a terminal diagnosis they are some they or someone they love have received. According to psychology today, grief is the acute pain that accompanies loss. Because it is a reflection of what we love, it can feel all compassion. Now from those definitions, we can surmise that grief is painful. It is sad. It is heartbreaking. <clears throat> so somehow, who is in his right mind, you know, would like to have this grief? As much as possible, we don't want to, to feel it. We don't want to hurt by it. But again, as we go through this transitory life, we will all feel the pain of having this grief. Now, none, not all people, I mean, not all people grieve the same way. Not all people grieve the same length of time. Some longer and some are shorter. But dealing with our grief is really essential. We need to come to terms with the loss of your loved one. You need to come to terms with what's happening to your life. And as they say, move on with your life. Over the time, the intensity of your grief, of my grief, 
we like it to subside. Time, as they say, will heal the wounds. But as most of the experts say, do not rush the grieving process. Let its process, let its process uh, take its time, take its course. Do not rush it. And do not expect that your feelings and emotions be like anyone else. We are a unique individual. We are created by God differently. So our time to grieve is different from one another. And somehow, it's something personal to us. So we grieve differently. And the time that comes with healing is different as well. So let that grieving process take its course. Now, if someone here is grieving right now, for whatever reasons, I pray that this lesson will help you. Number one, I pray that this lesson will help you go through with grief with a lot more ease. This will not take away your grief. This will not take away the pain. But it is my prayer that after the lesson, somehow, you will feel, you will feel a little bit more at ease. And you will be uh, feeling great with the Lord. The number two, that Jesus is with you and he cares so much about you and that you are not alone. But number three, that you will find a sense of purpose in your life. In our scripture reading, Isaiah 53, verse 3, the Bible said he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. Do you know that you have a grieving God? Do you know that you have a God, that you have God that is grieving with you? God grieves with all of us. Now, this verse is such a comforting verse to know that we have God that is no, <clears throat> he is no stranger to sorrow. God is no stranger to grief. If there will be a master or a, 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 a doctorate degree, if there will be a master's degree, doctorate degree, or whatever degree higher than those things, Jesus will be right there at the pinnacle. He will be the masters of the masters because he knows what is to grieve. Not only once or twice, but many times, you know, Jesus was rejected. Many times in his lifetime, Jesus was despised by so many people. And if you ever think that Jesus somehow is miles and miles and miles away from you when you are grieving, I want you to read this verse over and over and over again. Memorize it if you want. Memorize it. Memorize it if you can. And remind yourself that God grieves with you. In Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those whose spirits have been crushed. The shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, the Bible said, Jesus wept. Shortest verse, but one of the most powerful verse as well. It contains a lot of spiritual truth. And it shows a great deal about our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is a weeping God. He weeps with you. He is with you. He knows your pain. He knows your hurt. So he is there with you. He is beside you, weeping with you. And as we weep, let us not suppress our grief, it is okay to weep. It is okay to grieve. Somehow it will be a consolation for all of us to know, so to speak, that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, himself weep. Our Lord and Savior cried. He cried over the death of his beloved Lazarus. You know, Jesus cried and shed tears for the family, for the family of Lazarus, for the friends of Lazarus. 
Jesus did not suppress his emotions. He let his emotions be. You know, Jesus did not cry because of his inability to raise Lazarus or to heal Lazarus. No. He did not cry because of those things. He knew that he will raise Lazarus and he will heal Lazarus. He cried because, number one, he felt the pain of losing someone. He cried, number two, because he saw the family of Lazarus, the friends of Lazarus, crying. He felt the pain of those people. That's why Jesus wept. He did not wept, again, because of his inability to raise him. And in the later part of the scriptures, he raised Lazarus. He wept because he felt the pain. He knew what it was losing someone. Jesus did not suppress his emotions. He let his emotions be. And number three, Jesus showed his human side. He was not exempted to feel the pain. He was not exempted of feeling that pain of losing someone. You know, G Lazarus, Lazarus was very close to Jesus Christ. We all know that. And maybe Lazarus was like a brother to him. That's why when Lazarus died, he cried. He cried. In John 11, 3, so the sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love, the one you love, just like a brother to you, the one that you so much love is sick and eventually died. That's why Jesus wept. He knew what it feels like to lose someone. Now, in the Bible days, you know, people wept loudly. Okay? People, they, it's like wailing, as they say. When people wept loudly, when they wail, they do it, number one, to show their fierce anger. You know, they, they wail because they want to show that they are angry, especially when the cause of the death of that someone was caused by an injustices. So they cry their hearts out. Number two, they wail, they weep loudly to show sympathy to someone. And number three, they weep loudly to show their real emotions. Some people, you know, they really weep so hard. You can hear them across the room because of their emotions. It's okay. It's okay. And number four, sometimes weeping loudly, it was done hypocritically to gain people's attention. There are those, there are, there are those weeping out of, they just want to, you know, get people's attention out from an insincere heart. The Greek word for weeping is dakruo, which means to weep silently. When Jesus wept, the Greek word used in that word is dakruo, meaning to weep silently, to shed quiet tears. In this case, when Jesus was weeping, he was like sobbing. He was like, just like that. He was not wailing. He was not weeping loud. He was weeping to himself. And the cruel, it means that your tears falls from your eyes almost, you know, unnoticeably. It will suddenly fall from your eyes. But it is with all sincerity. When Jesus wept, his heart was breaking. It shows that when Jesus wept, it shows that we don't have a Savior that is stone cold. It shows that we don't have a Savior that's, that is indifferent and unconcerned with us. Remember, in your grief, you have a grieving God. 
in your emotions, you have a weeping God. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we have a sympathizing God. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Now, what does this mean? This means that Jesus, having made flesh, he experienced everything. He experienced what you experience. He experienced everything there is about grief. He experienced everything about miseries, about trials, about troubles, about pain of losing someone when he lost Lazarus. He experienced injustices. You see, Jesus can relate to us to whatever we are going through in life. That's why we have a sympathizing God. When we come to God with our brokenness, again, God knows what you are talking about. When you come to God, when you kneel before God, and you tell him about your brokenness, God knows what you are talking about because he sympathizes with you. God is not ignorant of how you feel. He is right there with you. He is not aloof from you. And with that said, that God is not aloof with you, let me be that one aloof with you and not God. Now, I will let you, I will let that joke sink into you for a few minutes. Then you can smile or laugh. So we have a sympathizing God. God knows what you're going through. And guess what? Not only that you have a sympathizing God, you have this. You have an empathizing God. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not only that you have a sympathizing God, we do have an empathizing God. What does this mean? Jesus not only acknowledges your emotions, what you're going through. But also, Jesus, he experienced the kind of suffering that you go through. Jesus went a little further by actually experiencing those feelings, those emotions that you are going through in life. Now, this verse tells us exactly that Jesus empathizes with you. Not only that he sympathizes with you, he went there so that he knows what you are going through. He was there. Now, two things in this verse. Number one is that Jesus, in his humility, he valued God the Father. He valued the Holy Spirit being others above himself. He valued the Father and the Holy Spirit above himself. Remember that Jesus Christ is God. Remember that he is God. And he did not take equality with God and went down and become, and he became human like all of us. So he, he valued the Father and the Holy Spirit above himself. When he was asked by the Father to go down to take on a human form, he took it. He took it humbly and he went down. He did not say to the Father, no, I'm like you. I'm God. No, he did not. He valued the Father and the Holy Spirit above himself and he went down. He came to become like human, just like us. And number two, Jesus in his humility, he value us. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at myself. Jesus value you more than himself. How? When instead of us dying for our sins on that cross, he took upon himself that cross. And he died for your sin. And he died for my sins as an ultimate sacrifice so that you and I could live 
so that you and I could have, could have that hope of eternal life in heaven someday. Now, as we go through in life, Jesus knows what you're going through. He's been there. As they say, been there, done that. And as Jesus empathizes with us, these are the three folds of Jesus' empathy. Number one, the emotional suffering. This is how Jesus empathizes with us. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 29, and after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You know, in Jesus' lifetime, he was constantly mocked. He was constantly ridiculed by many people. You know, even nearing his death, the people never stopped nor even take a break in ridiculing Mocking our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you this. What are the symbol, symbols for kingship and royalty? The symbols for kingship and royalty is the crown and the scepter. And look at what they give Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, they mocked him being the king of the Jews. They gave him a crown. But not that crown that you will be proud of wearing. A crown of thorns. And then they gave him a scepter, a scepter that you're not proud of showing, a scepter that is made of reed, like a bamboo, to ridicule him. See? And then they shouted, Hail, King of the Jews. Can you just imagine the humiliation he went through? The emotional sufferings that Jesus felt inside being God. So part of that empathy is that Jesus went through what you went through in your emotional suffering. Jesus suffered emotionally for you. He knows what you are going through emotionally because he's been there. In Luke chapter 22, 42 and 43, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. One of Jesus' emotional torment and moment comes when he was nearing his death. Can you imagine knowing precisely when and how you are going to die? Can you imagine that for a while? Can you imagine knowing at exactly what day, knowing what ex exactly what time you're going to die and how you're going to die. Can you imagine that? Jesus knew all those things. He knew that at exactly this time, at exactly this day, at exactly in this place, at exactly how he knew those things. That's why he went far from his apostles. He went to the garden far from those Apostle's eyes, and he prayed to God. And as he prayed to God for comfort, I'm pretty sure, you know, as the Bible continues to say, he was crying. He was crying. And he was emotionally stressed out. And then God sent an angel to comfort him. And you know what? That is exactly the same thing you and I would do to our children. When our children, when they are broken down emotionally, what are you going to do? You will put your arms around your children. You will put your arms around your wife or your, your family members, your friend. You will put your arms around them and comfort them. Just try to embrace them. You don't have to say anything. Just try to embrace them. And they will know the comfort that you are trying to give them. And they will feel comforted. That's what God the Father did to Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was so, so stressed out emotionally, he sent an angel to touch and comfort Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It is like 
the father saying to Jesus Christ, son, it's okay. I got your back. Now, Jesus suffered emotionally and he empathized with us emotionally. Number two, he empathizes with us with our physical suffering. In Luke chapter 23, verse 33, they nailed Jesus to a cross. And in Mark 15, 37, but Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Now, do I need to say more? He suffered so much for you and I. We know that what Jesus went through in his life before, you know, before even carrying that cross, before the Romans gave him that cross, we know what Jesus went through. He was beaten. What do we call it? Black and blue. He was beaten black and blue. Right. And, you know, the, the people were so cruel at him, and then they, they even gave him the cross. They even gave him the cross. You know, to be honest with you and your brothers and sisters, when I'm reading the death, every time, when I read about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, it breaks my heart, really. No joking. It really breaks my heart. And sometimes when I go about it, I stop doing what I'm doing and just contemplate and try to imagine myself being at Mount Golgotha. Trying to imagine myself being there, seeing my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. It's like really hurting to see your master, your savior, my savior, Jesus Christ, being treated that way. And we all know that Jesus, he did not deserve that kind of suffering, but he did for all of us. He suffered so much physical suffering so that he can empathize with you. Not only sympathize, but empathize with you. So when you are suffering physically because of whatever it is, that causes your pain, let it be known that Jesus Christ knew what you're going through because he went there just for you. I think nobody here amongst us suffered so great physically or even comes close to what Jesus suffered during our lifetime. Jesus empathized with us physically. And Jesus empathized with us in our relational sufferings. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, an angel of the Lord appeared to Jesus in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. We suffer relational loss with our friends and even with our families. We, we, we cut ties with them. Sometimes for just simple reason. So simple, number one, sometimes we, we cut ties with our friends, family members because of a simple gossip. Simple gossip. It cut ties with our relationship with our beloved. Right? Sometimes we cut ties with misunderstandings. There would be some misunderstandings within the family, but there are friends, and all of a sudden, we just don't talk to them anymore. We severe our relationship with them because of misunderstandings and sometimes because of personal reasons. But Jesus' relational sufferings, his was quite unique. His was quite incomparable to what we experience. You know, I have not seen, I have not seen anybody so despised by the society except for Jesus Christ. And why did I say that? Do you know from the moment, from the moment he was born, he was despised of. Now, let me tell you, do you know anybody from the moment they were born, they were so despised already? No, 
plan. But Jesus, from the moment he would learn that Jesus was born, he was already despised by so many people. He was despised already by the king. Can you imagine a child, a newborn babe? What can he do to a king? He was already despised. He was already hated by the king. And he was unwelcome. And Jesus, as he grew up and started his ministry, he was heavily persecuted. Everybody that was associated with him was also persecuted. And this persecution is a clear message to all to cut their ties with Jesus or else suffer the consequence of death. If you just associate yourself with Jesus Christ, then you will be persecuted. So that's why people, they are persecuting the followers of Jesus Christ to send the message, you cut your ties with Jesus Christ or else. You will be, you will be persecuted as well. And worse, you will be put to death. So the society wanted to cut relationship with Jesus Christ. And whatever it is that you have relationship with Jesus Christ, they are telling you, you cut your relationship with Jesus Christ. They wanted to cut the relationship of the apostles, of the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that the gospel will not be preached. They are thinking, if they persecuted the followers of Jesus Christ, and they put all the followers of Jesus Christ to death, they were thinking that the gospel will not be preached anymore. But they are wrong. The gospel keeps on moving forward. And until this day, we have the gospel. Now with this, Jesus empathized with us in our relational sufferings even so much more than we ever experienced. Again, empathy is not only Jesus putting himself in our shoes, but it is also taking action to alleviate our suffering. In the words of C.S. Lewis in his book, a grief observed, he said, have they never been to a dentist? The dentist drill, while an instrument of intense pain, ultimately brings health. The drill of grief fosters healing in our lives by raising ultimate issues and eternal questions, such as, who is my true beloved? And who is, or where is, my real hope? You know, our brokenness oftentimes are not an end in itself, but a means to truly finding real life. The drill of grief, as mentioned by C.S. Lewis, the drill of grief, though it brings us so much pain, but in the end, it will give us healing. It will give us real happiness. For by God's grace, Jesus empathized with us and we will be able to see blessedness in front of us behind our brokenness. Jesus took action to alleviate our sufferings, both here and especially in the afterlife, by ultimately dying on the cross so that we can truly answer who is my true beloved and where is my true home. Now we now know who is our true beloved and that is Jesus Christ who not only sympathize with us, but more so empathize with us. And the question now remains, where is my home? Where is my true home? As Jesus comforts his disciples, and as Jesus comforts all of us, because grief envelops all of us, and when Jesus, before his death, he was comforting his disciples, or after his death, sorry, after his death, Jesus comforted all his disciples because he knows that his disciples, they were enveloped with grief because the disciples know that Jesus will be leaving them. And these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to his apostles and disciples. In John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. 
Now, Jesus, like, his, like to his disciples, he comforted them. He gave them these comforting words because his apostles were grieving because they knew that Jesus Christ would leave them. Then as we see beyond our brokenness over our grief, there is a wonderful resting place that awaits all of us. And we know that it is in heaven. And this is how Jesus alleviates our suffering by Jesus Christ providing a heavenly rest for all of us. Can you imagine that Jesus Christ is preparing a room for all of us? Amen. That Jesus Christ wanted to have, wanted you to have your own room fully furnished your own house mansion with air condition with heating heaters you know everything so that you will be comforted so that you will be you will feel the comfort that Jesus wants all of us to have and it is in heaven now, because Jesus empathizes with you in your sufferings and wants to give you these wonderful blessings, he wants you to take this crucial step. In Psalm 62, verse 8, just one crucial step that Jesus wants you to take. Trust in him. Trust in him. Not just today. Trust him, not just tomorrow. Trust him at all times. At all times. You people, pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Now, Jesus, he needs our full trust. He needs your full trust in him as he holds your hands towards your brokenness and healing. Now, part of the trust that you can give to him is to tell God your heartaches. God wants you to pour your hearts to him. Your griefs, all those things that drag you down, and keeps you weary. Jesus said, give, pour out your hearts to him. Trust him with your most intricate situations, your most personal life. The thing that's so personal to you, lay it out to God. Trust God that he will take care of you and that he will be your shelter in the time of, your, in the time of storm in your life. And God want all of us to give him the trust, because he is our refuge. He is our rock. He is our refuge. The brethren and friends, nothing is more important with God than to see all of us get through with our brokenness. God wants to heal you. God wants you to be out of that brokenness in your grief. Now, I hope but this lesson, number one, help you go through with your grief with a lot more ease. And number two, I hope that you saw Jesus is with you all the way in your grief and that he cares so much about you and that you are not alone. Jesus is with you and we are with you. And I hope that you found a sense of purpose in your life. And that purpose is to help others in their griefs. And that brokenness is not the end, but a means of either a renewed or a newfound wonderful relationship with God. Now, my dear friends, isn't it comforting to know that God really cares for you? That God loves you so much. Now, I want to invite all of our friends who have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ to please come to Jesus Christ. Come now to Jesus Christ and accept him. And again, who can hinder you from baptizing into his name? And if any of you here suffering right now, whatever it is that you're feeling right now and wants to be prayed upon, prayed for, can I encourage you to come forward and we will pray for you. And I'm telling you that you're not alone and that we are here for you. Now, even those in our Zoom, those who are joining us in our Zoom, if you're going through with pain in life, whatever it is you're going through, you, know, you can type your, your message in the Zoom. And we have Brother Marcus, Brother Rex, and Sister Eva. 
looking at our Zoom. And if ever you want to pray for us, just type in there and they will let us know your message and we will pray for you. We want to know that we are, for, we are here for you. We are here for you. So Sister Diana, we are here for you. We love you, we are here for you. Now let me leave you with this wonderful and reassuring words of our Lord and Master himself, Jesus Christ. John 16, 22. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again. Wonderful. And your heart will rejoice. And no one, no one is going to take your joy away from you. Amen. Amen. As we sing the song of invitation, again, I want to encourage you to come forward. Let us pray for you. We will be waiting for you to come forward. Shall we stand as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning and God bless us all.